And we're back for another exciting episode of the Creators Collective. And this week, we're going to have a fun time. And particularly because we have a special guest, Paul Jackman, the man with the legs himself. Say hi, Paul. The one and only. <laughs> Paul Jack, dude. Yes. Uh, and if you've not seen his stuff, um, what uh, what hole have you been hiding in? But uh, we'll, we'll get to him in just a second. I do want to say a huge thank you to our patrons on Patreon. Uh, we don't have any new ones this week, uh, which is kind of sad, but oh well. <laughs> I do want to say a huge thank you to our top patrons, uh, particularly Dan, Darren Mates, uh, Caleb Harris from You Can Make This Too, and John from John Made It. Thank you. You guys are making this show possible. Uh, you can also join us live Thursdays at 10 a.m. Eastern Time on the Creators Collective YouTube channel. And uh, we try to uh, have a fun time in the live chat <laughs> so you can have a conversation in the background and ask us questions live. So that's about it uh, for what um, we normally talk about. Uh, let's start with uh, let's start with you, uh, Paul. What uh, what you got going on? Or actually, let's well, let's change that up a little bit since uh, um, uh, there, there may be one or two people who are listening who don't know who you are. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh I'm Paul Jackman from Jackman Works. I make stuff mostly out of wood. A lot of stuff that came from the trash or from pallets, which is one and the same. Um, try to make kind of odd stuff and, and weird designs and, uh, I don't know, eye-catching stuff. I, I have a bit of a strange obsession with the pallets, especially. And uh, I'm constantly exploring that genre and trying to push that further and further into absurdity. So, so the police haven't come and taken you for making shot glasses out of pallets yet? Not yet. Reddit thinks it police. should. <laughs> <laughs> I think so, Paul Jackman leads the most successful Reddit campaign of any YouTuber, yes. which is a very, very hard thing to do. Yeah, I, I started early and often, which helped. Well, I think, I think Reddit in particular, like they love hating on stuff. Yeah. And like you combine that you you mix the perfect amount of like amazing talent with just the right amount of things that people can hate and it goes it does really well on reddit <laughs> it's, it's great for engagement <laughs> it is it's fantastic <laughs> and I mean, people don't don't realize that like my titles in particular are picked on purpose to drive those sort of people to comment on the video or on the on the reddit post you're and, trolling the trollers and yeah. it's and it's Fantastical, I think it works. <laughs> I just my my last project had a bunch of pallet wood in it, and I posted that a couple of days ago. And uh, there was a couple of people who were like, "Wait, isn't this the guy that tried to kill people with pallet shot glasses?" <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, no, I, I I have so much respect for that. It's funny because it's like a telephone game where like it just keeps getting worse and worse every time. It's like, oh, isn't this the guy that gave kittens cancer with his pallet shot glasses? <laughs> yeah. Yep, it works. It works. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think as far as um, one of the things that I like most about Paul is like his his stuff is uh, I don't want to say unconventional, but it's it's uh, it's unique. It's creative. There's a lot of you know um, thought. In, in creativity that goes into the projects. It's not just, um, not that there's anything against building, you know, uh, replicating things or, or building, you know, basic stuff. But I really like the kind of the out of the box um, approach that you have. Yeah. I think we you have we a very have unique that. and uh, very specific to you video style as well. That uh, Yeah, the video and, and the humor in the videos is, is always fantastic. Yeah, I try to have fun with that. And, yeah. uh, woodworking can get kind of stuffy, so I'm trying to go yeah. to the, like the opposite side of the spectrum <laughs> with that, and and kind of pushing the boundary. And, but it's and like subtle. Powerful. It's not like it's not obnoxious. It's like if if you blink, you'll miss it. It's a yeah. lot of subtle humor, which which I really enjoy. Yeah, I, I love that kind of stuff. So except when you talk about dumpsters, hasn't seen your videos though. I mean, I'm sure everybody is familiar with who you are. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, what uh, what what you working on? What projects you got going? So I'm kind of in between projects right now. I just wrapped up a uh, a piece for Carolina Shoe. It was uh, a piece of wall art, kind of hard to describe, but it's it's basically just a giant wood cookie about two and a half three feet in diameter, 
and I it, it's merging between a, a pallet wood cookie lamination that mimics the shape of an actual cookie with the live edge and everything. And the, the bottom half is an actual wood cookie and they merge together at the Carolina logo. And there's a couple of uh, bow ties that are in the shape of bootlaces that tie together a, a crack that I made in the, in the wood by, by power carving it to shape. So that one just went up on Monday. I haven't seen the video yet, but I saw the project and I just saw the amount of, I think I saw it on your Instagram, the amount of glue ups involved in that. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, you're you're definitely like the the glue up. Uh, is it a masochist? Yeah. <laughs> like it's, if there's like, such a thing, it's you. Yeah. Hashtag you do glue ups like I do woodworking. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That, I I should have counted that. That was at least a half a dozen glue ups, I think. Yeah. 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 I, was it was it just me or did did the letters actually flow? In the grain so they were the right placement of the grain as well yeah so the the letters were continuous from the bottom That's slab sweet. up to the top so that was that was tricky to get yeah. the right piece of wood and cut it in the exact right spot so that it was inlaid in the right place no mess ups yeah, <laughs> yeah you only get one shot and that 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 cookie was over 300 dollars for that piece of wood like it's it's hard to find a dry wood cookie so you it have isn't to like, all split up, especially. Exactly. So you got to find the right one, and it's not it's not cheap. To what get kind it. of wood was that? It was ambrosia maple, oh, and it was cool. a, it was a burl too. Wow. Huh. So it was it was a nice piece. It was like yeah. it was the only one that I could find, at least near DC, that was dry, and uh, that just happened to be what it was. So it's a really nice looking piece of wood. Huh. Yeah, that was that's a neat project. <laughs> and if you want to win. He is offering that on his channel. Yeah, yeah, I actually made two. So there's a smaller version. The big one's going to the Carolina factory, and then the smaller version we're giving away. So it's a, a smaller cookie, foot and a half in diameter or so, but it's got the same, uh, it mimics the same styling. Huh. So what's what's next on your plate? I, your plans? I, I think next is going to be a, a, a Jackman-sized knife. And Does that mean... Uh, that means I'm, really big or really yeah. tiny, <laughs> really, really big. And I, I'm, I'm going to leave it at that and leave that as a teaser. But if you've been following some other people's social media, you'll kind of know the direction that this is going in. Hmm. I have not. I have no, I am totally lost. Hmm. He's, a, he's a buddy of yours, Zach. So I have, I have so many friends, Paul, <laughs> so many friends that I'll never find out. He, somebody, I'm, I'm assuming, sure somebody will figure it out. I gotta I'm watch assuming, it. I'm assuming he makes knives. Sometimes, yeah, yeah. Uh, does he live in the states? Yep. Ooh, Darista. Potentially. Hmm. Uh, bland, bland in the chat uh, says that your beard is on game and on point. Uh, make a bush beard comb out of pallet wood. <laughs> <laughs> Give your beard some cancer. Yeah, I need it. Yeah, it's funny. People, people are trying to figure out what I should make next, and we're talking about like a baby rattle or just something completely just for Johnny. Stir up the beast. baby rattle for Johnny. Right out of pallet wood. <laughs> a chew toy for cats. <laughs> pallet wood go, baby rattle. Go, Don't use oh it. Oh my god, that would be red. That's Reddit gold right there. No, all you need to do is. Uh, have a little bit of like a lead solder in there somewhere. Yeah, right. uh, a lead in pallet wood uh, cereal bowl. Yes. Lead inlaid. The coated in lacquer that never cures. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Well, uh, Make Brooklyn actually had a question for you. Yeah. Um, did you have a, te a teacher or mentor who helped you build uh, your video editing style? Or was it just trial and error? Also, uh, could you stop giving cancer to kittens? It's kind of mean. <laughs> <laughs> I'll think about it. Uh, well, I mean, I, I had mentors for the woodworking stuff. I started in high school. I went to a vocational high school. So freshman vocational to senior year. Vocational high school? That sounds fun. Vocational <laughs> high school, yeah. So it was four years of of woodworking and carpentry. And uh, the, the way that it worked is it was off and on week. So every other week I had a shop week. The whole week I was in the shop learning whatever we were doing that week. And then the opposite weeks were academic that we had regular classes. 
Um, so that was a big part in me getting started early on, on the woodworking stuff and had a lot, a lot of great teachers during those four years that really gave me a good kick in the butt developing the skills, like the kind of the backbone of the whole woodworking stuff. I think his question was almost directed at uh, the, the video editing style and like how that came about. Okay. So specifically for the videos, not, not really. I mean, my buddy Pat Lapp from Le Pic Bois, the, uh, the French Canadian buddy, uh, he's helped me a lot just as far as like teaching me the, the, uh, the programs and stuff and how to use those and, and kind of teach me a little bit of special effects and, and motion tracking and um, kind of learns, teaches me new skills every once in a while when I ask him about it, but he's, uh, he's a pro. He used to do that stuff uh, full time and, and he's really good with, especially the special effects. And uh, he's, he's got a lot of skills in that. So whenever I think of something I, I could potentially do in a video, I was like, is this possible? He's like, Oh yeah, you just got to do this. <laughs> So he's been a huge help for me, and and the style has just been something that evolved. I I started making videos like Jimmy's, like Jimmy Diresta, and it was just fast edits, no music or anything. And over the three three and a half years that I've been doing it, it's it's just evolved into what it is today. Just slowly, each video has kind of added something new to it. I think that's fairly common because I mean I feel like a, like a lot of the people, myself included, start out doing one thing they're like okay this is like this is the home base like this is the you know how i'm going to do my videos and a lot of it's just the fast sped up thing and then eventually you kind of find your own niche and your own style so yeah i think a lot of people a lot of people ask that like how do you find your style it's just something that happens naturally as, as far as i'm concerned yeah yeah you start you know the more uh, you know when you get into it you don't realize how much time editing takes and then, and then once you start developing your own style, you're like, I can't believe how much more time editing takes. And it's, yeah. I mean, it just gets progressively deeper. Like yeah. the more videos you put out, the more time you spend editing those videos because you just, you know, you learn, learn things that, you know, I look back at my videos from like even three months ago. And I'm like, oh my God, I didn't do any white balancing at all. And, you know, right. like these things that you don't even at first and, and that's fine i think it would be totally overwhelming if you set out to you know to to do something it, i think it's possible to get too ambitious off off the, out of the gates and starting with something that's simple like that is is a good way to get the moment to kind of get the ball rolling essentially yeah yeah and you never know what your style is until you actually get into it yeah and especially since most people are starting at zero like they yeah. I've never edited a video in their life. Like just learning the software alone is 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 hard enough. So if you kind of have a baseline to work from, and then once you learn your software, then you find out that you want a different piece of software, and you have to learn that one. <laughs> yep. Right, exactly. <laughs> yep. Cool. Uh, well, Zach, what you got going on? Um, so I recently just finished up. If you can see it here on this camera. Oh, cute! That is a little pocket cleaver that's like almost as big as your palm anyway i made five of these and um actually I, this is the only one that i have finished i have to to sharpen the edge on the other four and uh, two of them i'm giving away as gifts one i'm keeping for myself and i think if all goes well i'm gonna to do a, something kind of that i've never seen before i'm gonna auction it on my instagram but it's gonna be a buy one give one free uh, so essentially whoever wins the auction, I'm going to send them one of these and then I'm going to send the other one to their favorite, uh, their favorite social media person, you know, on Instagram or something. So cool they'll, they'll put their bid in and tag who they want me to send the other one to and whoever wins it, that's how it's going to work. Uh, but yeah, this is, uh, these things are awesome. I just kind of want to make like a little handy, uh, you know, shop knife. It's, uh, like a box opener and whatever else you need it for. So I like the Those curve are, in that too. What's that? I like the curve in it. Yeah, I can't, I, uh, you know, so these I've made now, I think I've made six knives and uh, I don't know how anybody makes a living doing them because they, they are so much work. I mean, it's not the blade that takes the time. I mean, you can cut that out, do your heat treat and stuff. It's when you get to, um, you know, doing the handles and hand sanding stuff. It's just, it's crazy. 
Uh, it's a lot of fun, but so that's what I've been working on, uh, waiting for the, the stuff to get in for that. Also, um, I just got some stabilizing equipment in so that I can start doing some uh, stabilizing some some wood and casting with epoxy to do some cool like knife scales and some other stuff for a project I have coming up. And tomorrow I'm heading out to uh, Newark, New Jersey to <clears throat> spend two days uh, forging hammers with uh, Cliff Dufton, who's CJ Dufton on Instagram, and uh, uh, John Arian, uh, Sunset Forge NJ on Instagram. They're both amazing smiths. Uh, make <laughs> they're. They love making hammers and and that's something that I kind of want to get better at. So I'm going up there for a few days and we're going to make some hammers. So yeah, that's, that's kind of what's going, what's been going on with me and anybody who's in that area. I think, uh, well, I was talking to, uh, KJ sawdust, uh, and, uh, we're, we're going to have like a hangout up, up there tomorrow, which is Friday night. We're going to go grab some food and drink some more. So anybody who's in that area, let me know and, uh, we'll, we'll meet up. So sweetness. Yeah. I think that's everything. What about you? <laughs> well, I've actually been working on the table again and I'm, it's my goal to get the dining room table done by uh, the end of July. And so I just put out a video on Saturday uh, doing the, 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 the final touches on the, the top uh, before actually doing the actual final touches, <laughs> which, <laughs> uh, filling all the bug holes, filling the, the last bit of the gap and uh, using up like another gallon's worth of epoxy. And then flipping the table over, which doesn't sound like much, uh, but it's a 400-pound, 11-foot-long, 5-foot-wide tabletop that needs to be flipped. How is that thing going to leave your basement? The same way it came in. Just carry it. it. 11 feet long? Yeah. Huh. No, it, uh, I, I can get up to 13 feet in my basement um, down the stairs and around the corner. That's impressive so are you yeah. gonna have when you take it out are you gonna have to take it up in pieces or will it come up and well the the top will come up by itself and then the okay. base um the entire base is not going to be glued together it's all gonna be held together with gravity um so oh. every piece can come apart and be carried separately nice is it a walkout basement or you got to bring that thing up the stairs up the stairs so about awesome. four guys in five minutes and it should go fairly easily yeah but, uh, hmm. be, some bodies in there. there's a quote yeah. for somebody <laughs> <laughs> four guys in five minutes put that on the t-shirt <laughs> <laughs> we i wish somebody with way more time and less of a life than myself could go back and <laughs> and cut out every james ism and just make <laughs> just make a compilation uh, so uh yeah the thing i've got going on the shop right now is i'm actually starting work on the base uh so this week i took a day and a half to rip down the boards, I have three slabs of elm that are 16 inches wide, and I needed to rip them all down into all the pieces for the, the base. And that was 160 feet of ripping through two inch thick elm mm -mm. with a handsaw. How long did that take? A day and a half. <laughs> wow. <laughs> About halfway through, I was thinking, I should just grab my circular saw. And then I went to grab my circular saw and remembered, oh, wait, I burnt out the motor last time I used it. Wow. So I'm going to have to burn out this motor. <laughs> oh, that's but crazy. that's done, so I'm happy. Yeah, all you got to do is make enough cuts to, to get it on camera and then do the rest off camera on, on the circular yeah. saw. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, would be, uh, that would be the nice way to do it. But... That's crazy. Well, you say we get into a few questions. Uh, let's see. Uh, Bland Bland um, offered up a question. Uh, uh, James is a hand tool enthusiast. Would it be wise? Would it be wisest decision to still purchase a bandsaw table saw? And at Paul, do you pre-plan your projects or just kind of go with your mental flow? Um, just as a quick answer, if you want a table saw bandsaw, go ahead and get it. Um, people Unless don't you want to spend a day and a half ripping a piece of lumber. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people don't become hand tool woodworkers 
because they want to build things. They become hand tool woodworkers because they want to work with hand tools. Uh, and if that is not your thing, then, then get some power tools. A hybrid woodworking is a good way to go. What about uh, you, Paul? What do you uh, what do you plan your project? Uh, do you plan your projects or just kind of go with the seat of your, your pants? I I'd say the majority of them are are completely planned out with plans and SketchUp and everything, and I like to to visualize things. Like I after high school, I went to to college for civil engineering, so my my brain thinks a lot in that in the way of engineering and where I like to like very strictly kind of have everything dialed in before I go into the shop. So I have the SketchUp plans made completely with dimensions and, and all that uh, before I go in the shop for most things. Um, other things kind of develop as they go and they have like a general idea before I go in the shop. But I don't know, anything that can have dimensions usually has them before I, I step foot. In the I'm, shop. I'm the same exact way, but I wonder if you're the same as me to where you'll have something completely planned out and you know SketchUp or whatever you can rotate it and you're like okay it's the dimensions are good everything looks right it's purport it's proportion well and you're ready for business and then you get out there halfway through the project and you're like oh my god i just had an amazing idea that's going to make this even cooler i mean i feel like that happens to me every project it's like i try and get it as good as possible in the program but then once i get out there usually i'll get some new ideas and new inspiration and stuff that somehow gets incorporated you know the, the dimensions still the, usually stay the same but it's just mm -hmm. you know some of the details tend to to change in the process you know yeah, i feel like that's definitely it. i feel like a lot I of the creative like for me. yeah i mean i feel like the the 3d software is that's what it's most useful for is planning out the dimensions and the size and the form but a lot mm -hmm. of the details for me change as I'm out there working, I feel like that's where I do my best, like creative thinking is when I'm hands on. So, yeah. yeah, I think a lot of times for me that happens in SketchUp, like I'll, I'll draw something and then I'm like, Oh, wait a second. And I like completely blow mm -hmm. that up and redraw it. Um, but still in the shop, I will have those ideas where I'm like, Oh, I forgot I had this material. Like I'm yeah. going to incorporate that. And yeah. Completely changes the plans then. Yeah. But it always makes for a cooler piece anyway. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh, cool. What? Let's see. What's the next question list? Um, oh, we have very few questions for you, Paul. Apparently, people are too intimidated by you. <laughs> <laughs> do you guys clean on a regular basis, or do you clean and organize after each project? Anyone wants to take this one? <laughs> I can go, I suppose. Um, so, historically, or... <laughs> <laughs> or, or traditionally my shop has been chaotic and I find here's what's crazy is like I have so many tools in my tiny shop it's unbelievable to me and right now I have the most tools I've ever had in my shop and, you know tons of equipment I can't believe it's in there and my shop has the most room and it's the cleanest it's ever been so it's strange but I feel like I've had I have to keep it clean now which didn't used to be the case. I mean, if I look back at my videos from two years ago when I had like five tools in my shop, it was a disaster. I could hardly walk in there. And now I have, you know, industrial grinding machines, hydro 25 ton forging press, table saws, band saws, horizontal band saws. I, I pretty much have everything I could ever want. And it's insane how much room I have in my shop. And it's just forced me to organize better and keep it clean. So now it's to the point to where I can't afford to not be organized. I need that space. And um, so it's actually been a good thing. And, and yeah, it's, it's really forced me to, uh, you know, take, spend more time cleaning up at the end of the day. And uh, it's just a much more, and my, my shop experience is so much better when I know where things are. And I find when it's cluttered, I'll set something down and I'm like, I've only taken five steps and I've been looking for this thing for 30 minutes, you know? <laughs> so I don't know. It's yeah, it's, it's um, definitely uh, there's, it's adv advantageous to, to keep things tidy and, and have a place for, for your stuff. I find. 
Yeah. I'm I'm still convinced that you have like the Narnia wardrobe in your shop or something. <laughs> it's like every time you get another one of those big tools, I ask you, how are you going to fit that in there? And like, oh, I'll fit it. And it fits. Somehow. <laughs> every I single mean, it's, time. It, it's true. Like, I feel like somehow my shop grows every time I put a, a tool in there. I just, I find a way for it to work. So, yeah, it's like a old, I mean, it's, I, I don't know if it's like a one and a half car garage or what. I mean, you could, you could probably fit a car and a motorcycle in there. And I have so much equipment in there. It's crazy. And now I have room to walk around. It's, I don't get it. Yeah. What's the square footage on the space? I don't know. It's like 20. I think it's like 19 by 18 or something like that. Okay. I don't feel like doing the math right now, but less than 400. Cool. 370. What about you, Paul? What's your size? Mine's uh, 330 <laughs> square feet. So right. it's a little, it's a little bit smaller. <laughs> Do you but, clean regularly or just after projects? Yeah. I mean, I have to just because it's such a small space. Um, I, I clean at, basically at the end of every day, I do kind of just a general clean up, put the tools away. And then after every project to do like a full clean up, sweep the floors, like everything goes in its place. And uh, that's just so you can start the next project fresh and you're not tripping over anything. And you know where all your tools are. I, you know, I find that um, just a little bit at the end of each day, like just putting things back is yeah. makes it makes a huge difference because like going out to a dirt it's a lot nicer just to walk out into a clean shop it's just like sets the mood versus you know leaving all your crap out and trying to clean it the next morning because usually you if you're like me you're you know anxious to get started and uh i don't know yeah it's, it's so much more motivating when you just have to clear workbench space everywhere and it's just a yeah. fresh palette at the beginning of every day pun intended <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, here's a question for you. Uh, Tony Huffington from, uh, he's the, uh, the Luthier. That, yeah, uh, everyone says. yeah, I know him. Um, actually, we'll probably have him on the, the podcast here soon. Um, hey, Paul, how much do you, how much do you, how much do you set up your shop knowing you'll probably move in the upcoming future with your wife being in the military and all? Do you keep stuff in boxes? So, yeah. So my wife is in the, in the Coast Guard and we move every, uh, three years theoretically. Um, the <laughs> the last shop we were there for one year, and then we moved to DC. Uh, so it's it's ever ever changing. And uh, I've as as the shops have changed. This is my third shop now in the past three years, and I kind of get smarter as the new shops come along. And a lot of the shop furniture that I've built is made to be. Uh, modular and and mobile as well. So like my miter saw station is this big 12 foot long bank of cabinets, but it's in three foot sections and they're all on wheels. So that's something new from the DC shop that, that I've built. So the next move, all I have to do is unscrew them from each other and they'll wheel into the moving truck on, the, on their own. And then I just wheel them into the new shop and kind of configure them however they fit in the new space. I think um, you should just buy an old school bus and outfit it. <laughs> Yes. I've I've thought about it. <laughs> I think that'd be super cool. I mean, how neat would that be? Like events and stuff. You just yeah. I mean, yeah. me and my wife have talked about like tiny homes. <clears throat> like instead of moving all of the stuff in our house, we would just move our house every time. And then we tiny just have shop. To... That's right. what you should do. You should not do a tiny home because you'll get you know you move to your home. But have a tiny shop that's like a shop on a trailer. Or we just That's get cool like two be. two trailers. <laughs> so every time we move, we just get two giant trucks to pull our house and pull my shop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so do you know? Do you have any plans for like where you're going to be moving next? It seems it's like, always seems like uh, you, you've you've caught the affinity for the Northwest, huh? Yeah, yeah. It's it's always up in the air, and it's not always up to us either. But we <laughs> this past summer, well, a couple months ago. Um, we went and visited the the Northwest, so we went out to Maker Fair in San Francisco. But we flew to Seattle and drove down to San Francisco. Just took a week, just road tripping down, and I'd never been out there, and it's it's an amazing spot. I, I told you, man. Like I, I told you, you have to do the one hundred and one. You did, right? Yeah, we did. Yeah. Most of the way, we just drove right along the water. Yeah, yeah. And it's all, all the way such down. A cool to, I don't remember where we stopped, but uh, it's, where, it's uh, 
you have any favorite spots? Oh man, um, <laughs> all of it. Yeah, <laughs> I can't even remember this point because it all blends together because it's all just like amazing <laughs> geography and, um, I mean, one. I'm trying to think of the name of it. Um, one of the spots that we stopped, I think it was in Oregon. I'm looking at the map now. Um, I forget the name of it. I uh, <laughs> I was calling it the the devil's butthole. And, oh uh, yeah, the uh, um, I forget what the uh, actual name of it is. It was the devil the, something. The, yeah, the um, I know what you're talking about. And I, I mean, basically, it's uh, it's like a volcanic rock formation right on the ocean. Uh, and devil's, there's like a devil's punch bowl. Yeah, that's it. Devil's punch bowl. Uh, that's a more appropriate name, I guess. <laughs> and uh, it's it's this uh, rock formation where there's like a couple of like inlets into the volcanic rock where it's eroded away, and the tide just like splashes against these rocks and just hammers them, and you get like this thunderous clap every time, and it just like spits up in these kind of geyser sort of things. And there's like <laughs> one spot where there's a hole through the rock, and it's like carved underneath. So basically, when when the waves come in, it like carves underneath this rock and shoots through this hole, and it's just like this awesome formation. It's hard to describe unless unless you see it in person. Yeah, that's uh, right between like Depot Bay and Lincoln City, which is when when my wife and I lived in Portland, we'd vacation there like yeah. every year. Um, yeah. So, well, we're moving to, at least we're looking heavily, we're talking to an agent and stuff about uh, Bellingham, Washington. So hopefully by this time next year, we'll be up there, which Will tells me is where Grizzly is headquartered. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I'll so. actually be in uh, Portland next month. Oh, man. Anytime, anytime like my friends go to the Northwest or Portland, I just, I get like envy. <laughs> Bell Bellingham is up there though, isn't it? Pretty it's, far north. Yeah, it's about I think an hour and a half north of Seattle ish. It's pretty close to Canada. It's wow. literally, I think, the furthest contiguous city from where I live. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So you, you just want to get out of Florida that I, day. I do. It's like I, I was looking the other day. It was like fifty-eight degrees. I'm like, oh my god, that sounds because it's. It's like 94 plus the humid. The heat index is 107 probably here. And I'm going to Newark and like they've been experiencing like a record breaking heat wave this week. I'm like, it's so it's actually the other day. It's it's been hotter up there than it is down here, which is kind of a bummer. I was hoping to hoping to escape for a few days. Yeah, we've been hitting 100 here the past couple of days. Ugh. It was crazy. Yeah. So, are there any uh, are there any bases or anything over on the up there? There, there's a ton along the west coast. Yeah. And when when we were driving through, we we just accidentally drove by like three or four of them. Huh. So I'm sure there's plenty more out there. So we're we're kind of hoping maybe next time we can kind of push our way out to the northwest. But there's also a lot of coast guard bases on the Gulf Coast. So we yeah, <laughs> we don't do we it, get the, the short end of the stick there. Hey, like, well. I, that's that's the last place I want to go. I basically told my wife, we can't go south of, of DC. Like that's kind of my yeah. limit. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a big dude. I don't take heat too well. So. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, let's see. We got another question. Um, I need to come up with the quickest, most effective way to flatten a thick, dry hickory slab. Anyone have suggestions? <laughs> So it depends on how long it is, I guess. Yeah. Let's make the assumption of an eight foot by two foot slab. Yeah, because that's trickier. Because I I just flattened that cookie, but that was like four feet by three feet, so it fit on my workbench, and I just made a flattening jig on the workbench. Uh, but that's tougher if you kind of if it doesn't fit and you got to slide it around because then you kind of lose that reference surface. I uh. uh... I, I don't think I would do it with a hand plane. You sure about that? Really? I think that's exactly what you would do. Well, I just flattened the uh, the big table that's uh, five foot by eleven foot, um, and I made a router jig for that because uh, you can you can make up a router jig uh, really quickly, and even if it's something longer than that, you can put extensions onto the table that the jig is actually built on, which is what I did because I kind of built it on my bench. 
Um, my, my bench is eight foot by two foot. So there's uh, you know a foot and a half sticking off either end, uh, either side, and several feet off of either end. Uh, huh. So I actually built outriggers that made the bench bigger to fit it on. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, it was quicker I, to do that than it was to flatten it by hand. Yeah, I was gonna say I think that's probably the quickest way. Yeah, yeah, as long as, as long as your reference surface is flat, it doesn't really matter what it is. Yeah, even build it on the floor. Yeah, yeah. Do it in the driveway. Yeah. Either that or buy a bigger planer. <laughs> hey, honey, I need to buy a thirty-six inch planer. I think that's that's a good excuse, don't you think? I I take that. <laughs> I don't know how that'd go over. If if I had the space and the power for it, I might do that. <laughs> so, you, need, you need your tiny shop, man. You're right. With the 36 inch planer, that'll take up half the floor space or something. <laughs> Put it on the roof, a flip top. I'll, I'll need like the in feed and out feed. So the table saw and the planer and the joints are all lined up. So I basically just send a board in one end of the trailer and it pops out yeah. the other side of finished the product. The front door and the back door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I push a board in the table saw and it just automatically feeds in and it pops out a table. You have like a, a swiveling dead man on the front and the back. It'll go right. Up and, yeah. <laughs> That'd be sweet. I need to get like one of those double decker buses or something. <laughs> that's get, that's not a bad idea. There's double a ton, level shop. There's a ton of those here in the states. Yeah, there's not. <laughs> that might be harder. <laughs> uh, okay, we got another question. Um, I'm thinking of making a knife from an old file. Do I need to do any heat treating on it after file after final sharpening? I would say yes. Uh, well, you're going to need to do. Here's how I would go about it. Well, there's, I guess there's a couple ways. It depends on what you're going to do. If you're going to do any forging, you're going to want to anneal it first. Um, so you're going to want to heat it up and like stick it in like a thing of sand or vermiculite or something. Let it cool very, very slowly over a few hours. That'll soften it up because, um, yeah, it's just hard to it's hard to work with it when it's in its hardened state, and uh, I, that's how I would do it. Plus, it'll kind of relieve some of the stress and stuff. Um, if you just want to do stock removal, you could grind the way it is, but you'd want to um, be careful with the heat and not get it too hot because you'll ruin the temper. But uh, you know, it's with a file, it's hard to say because I don't know what the tempering is on those. I would imagine they're pretty brittle. I mean, every file I've ever seen is <laughs> pretty brittle, so you might want to temper it. Um, it's it, it really depends on... I'd say it really depends on what you're trying to do with it. If you're just going stock removal, I'm trying to think what I would do. I would probably anneal it just to save yourself a lot of time grinding. Yeah. And uh, it'd be a lot easier on your abrasives and it would just go way better. Um, I do that. I'd get it to shape. And then I would, you, if you do that, if you anneal it, you're going to have to reheat treat it. So get it up to critical, quench it, and then temper it for, you know, a couple cycles at a couple of two hour cycles at like 400 degrees. I'd say that's kind of like your average, um, you know, shotgun approach to, dealing with unknown metals uh, and i'm not an expert on this so i mean if you if you know somebody who's made more than six knives i suggest that you talk to them instead <laughs> that's, that's how that's how i would go about it yeah cool well uh we've got the creators photo challenge we're not going to be working out this week but just to remind everyone we will be doing it next week we'll be picking the winner and that is for contrast. So to enter the Creators Photo Challenge, you just have to submit a picture on Instagram and hashtag Creators Photo Challenge. And uh, we're looking for a photo in your shop, something would do with uh, you know what you're making that has a good contrast in it. Uh, we will be picking a winner, and I think this next week it is Zach's turn to uh, pick a prize for someone so he can win something oh. out of Zach's shop. Yes be exciting to see what he picks uh so yeah get those in before next week uh, next uh, thursday speaking of contrast those orange buckets from home depot are the worst thing you can ever have in your <laughs> shop when you're shooting I've, I've realized this is one of those things since i started like going into the you know caring more about my edits and like color grading and white balance and all of that and the home depot buckets if it's in the background of anything it's gonna wreck 
<laughs> whatever you're shooting, any picture, any video, they're terrible. Like it's <laughs> like, it can be, you can have the smallest aperture and it can be the most out of focus thing on the shop. And in that picture, your eyes are going to go right to the bucket. <laughs> it's just so, yeah. yeah. Same as like the, like the yellow DeWalt tools. There's yeah. just, I, they're, they're terrible. And people it's, ask it's, me why I have BLO on all and Oak on all of my stuff because it's it's all one color format. That and my the, my blue tools, so it actually goes well. Yeah, it's just any any like no power light, tools vibrant in colors are just ugh. yeah. And everybody knows what that bucket is too. Yeah. You don't need you don't need to see the label. Like as soon as nope. you see the orange bucket, it's you know great. It on the, I mean, the, who, they did a great part on that, but I don't think it was an intentional move. But yeah, I I got lucky. I got a bunch of like maroon colored buckets uh it's it's what the the diesel oil for the coast guard boats is stored in nice. so my my wife snagged a bunch of those from the trash so i have i don't know a dozen of them in the shop just holding random stuff and yeah they don't, like, they don't stick out quite as much <laughs> every time i try and like i set up for a picture for my instagram or something in my shop and like i get my camera dialed in i'm like dang it <laughs> like just like just in this the smallest little corner of it'll be like in the corner of the the picture and i have to like go move it <laughs> throw a blanket over it yeah i just need to get rid of them well we have a uh, joke for the week uh it comes from uh, tony oldman i think i think we should let paul read it cuz you know do you see it paul cuz paul's just seems like he'd be good at reading bad jokes yeah, this is this one would fit you too <laughs> it's a good one for you <laughs> I like it. So the joke is, I put my whole dust collection system up on Craigslist the other day. All it was doing was sitting in the shop and collecting dust. <laughs> I love uh, these jokes. They're so great. They don't stop uh, either. That's what blows my mind. Is that we've been doing this for, what? How long have we been? Is this like This is the 86th. Uh, yeah, 86th episode. So wow, 86. so we're coming up on two years. It's going to be fun. That's crazy. And we still have terrible jokes every week. So if you have a horrible joke that uh, has something to do with making, uh, feel free to send it to us and we will uh, we will cringe and eventually uh, <laughs> cause some harm to someone somewhere who tries to gouge out their ears next time they listen to the podcast. <laughs> oh, uh, Paul and I should make our announcement. <laughs> yeah, is, is this public? <laughs> I think so. Why not? We're getting, we're getting uh, married we're moving out to Washington and getting married <laughs> in the devil's butthole. <laughs> in the devil's butthole. <laughs> <laughs> so Paul and I are going to be speaking at WorkbenchCon in 2019. Woot woot. Yeah. I'm going to be out there for that one. You're going to make it? I think so. Nice. Uh, it's, it's February, right? I think so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you, uh, you know, I've gone to a lot of like, excuses for makers to meet up and i feel like that's what most of them are it's like nah, let's do this this year and everybody kind of gets together for that but the uh the workbench con thing was hands down the best one i've been to there's just so many people there and uh it's just a great experience so anybody who's on the fence about workbench con i would i would uh, nudge you to try and make it happen yeah where are they going to be this year atlanta i think it's the it's same place same, same place okay yeah yep I mean, yeah, I can't gonna... believe I can't believe how big and successful it was for seemed like relatively short notice for the last one. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of yeah. there's talks, there kind of talks about it, but you didn't really hear any any like concrete uh, plans, you know, about it until just a couple of months before it happened. So I think this this next one, year, this next year, is going to be really really big. Yeah, because that was that was the first year this year, and. I felt like they didn't do a very good job describing what it actually was. So we were all kind of going into it, not completely knowing what was going on there. But and, it was still uh, a lot of people there. It was a lot of people. Yeah. 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 And, and they're talking about it being even bigger next oh, year. Without a doubt. I, I bet it's going to be at least three times bigger this year. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I was talking with the organizer and she said they're they're probably going to have to get a different space because that the space for this year wouldn't be big enough. It was pretty packed. I mean, they were... They were at like ninety percent capacity, I think, last time. Yeah. And so I can I can only imagine, you know, next year, especially with us speaking. 
packed house. <laughs> We're going to get up on stage and our beards are going to merge together and it's just it's going to be magic. <laughs> I like shaved mine too far on accident the other day. Like I usually like have a little bit more under my chin and I just yeah. I just didn't pay attention uh, and I shaved it off and I'm like what did I do? What did I do to my face? I was wondering why you look like such a baby today. I know my head shrunk. I feel like yeah. I lost like it's weird. That's why I mashed my head. The dimensions are off. It's it's yeah, it's strange. It was a mistake. Your your workflow is gonna be off for the next couple of weeks. It so. is. I'm just gonna to have to not record until a little bit goes back a little bit. Yeah. So you guys do you guys ever accidentally shaved and regretted it? You're like, yeah. oh my god, what happened? I look like I'm I can't I'm, even buy I can't even buy beer anymore. <laughs> Like I'm just I'm just gonna take off a little more. Oh, uh, a little bit more. Oh, oh, it's gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep. Well, let's uh, let's talk about what's been inspiring us. Uh, Paul is the guest. Uh, what are you inspired by? What are you watching, reading? So I'm gonna recommend a podcast. Appropriately enough, it's not a maker podcast though. It's called the Good One Podcast, and it's it's a, a comedy podcast, but it's not. Um, it's not like a typical comedy podcast. It's basically this: the host uh, brings on a different comedian every week, and they dissect a, a specific joke that the the comedian has has written. Like uh, Bo Burnham was on this past week. I'm a huge fan of him. We're we're the same age, and we grew up in the same area. And um, he he just like dives deep into one of these jokes, and and they kind of dissect how that the joke was crafted. So I, I think of it a lot similar to what we do. Um, where we kind of physically craft stuff and, and take at it from different angles to come to a, a final piece. And, and they kind of mentally craft things to come to that final joke. So it's, it's very interesting to hear uh, the mindset coming from, from somebody who does a similar thing, but in like a very, very different, different medium. Genre. Yeah. Huh. And, and it's, it's a different comedian every week. And so it's really interesting and, and different every week. And that's just something I came upon uh, a few weeks ago. Oh, that's Definitely get to look that up. <clears throat> cool. Well, I'm going to have to uh, go with someone that we probably all know, uh, Alex Steele. Uh, he just hit 1 million subscribers on YouTube, which is a huge, huge milestone. Uh, but to celebrate it, he made a gold knife, a gold kitchen knife, <laughs> out of forging solid gold. Um, and <laughs> it's just one of these, these eye-opening things of, holy cow... <laughs> An absolutely worthless knife, but uh, wow! Um, and so he got to experiment with actually, you know, forging gold. Was it feel much like money? Did, does he did he say how much money the? Yeah, it was something was like three thousand dollars for the, the the steel for the gold. <laughs> <laughs> you know, saving all the shavings as you you know, you're, you're, you're grinding the gold down. <laughs> That's crazy. It was, huh. it was just a really awesome. really cool video, and uh, yeah. It's one you gotta watch. I'm looking forward to. He'll be finishing it soon, putting a handle on it, and uh, it should be a. So build. yeah, he's like the Steve Irwin of blacksmithing. Like I feel like he's he's <laughs> like the he's the crocodile hunter of forging. Yeah. Um, and which segues into my choice, which I've probably used before, but I'm gonna use it again. Uh, uh, Pete Braspeninks from Fireforge, P H Y R E. He is the MC Usher of blacksmithing. Um, it's you know I feel like most most of our, our listeners are probably woodworkers and but just check out his Instagram and look at his pieces and just spend a minute thinking how they were made. It will blow your mind. I mean they're puzzles. You, you look at them and you just you don't understand how they were made. It's crazy. And he's a super. I, I met him at Indianapolis and he's just a great guy. Super talented. There's nobody in, I don't think anybody in the history of civilization has ever done the things with metal that he's doing with them. So definitely check him out. And also I've been kind of delving into some more architectural stuff just to get some style cues and uh, came across an, an old uh, architect, uh, Victor Horta who is kind of a art nouveau architect and he's just amazing. Um, he's one of those people that didn't, didn't, he didn't just like design. He's like, okay, here's the exterior of a building. He's one of those people. It's like, no, this is how everything 
this is how every single piece of this entire building needs to be like this. And uh, it's just everything he built just like breathes. I don't know how to explain it. So, yeah, I have like two this week, I guess. Uh, then why don't you tell us what's your favorite uh, tool of the week? Um, I think I probably use this, but I'm going to say my even heat kiln because that's uh, what I've been using the past couple weeks um oh, where'd my window go i don't really have a link for that they're all like kind of custom ordered um but yeah it's it's so nice when you're forging stuff to be able to just dial in the temperature and the time that you want it to cycle for and know that everything is going to be exactly the way you want it to be it really takes like the the chance and the guesswork out of heat treating and tampering and all of that sweet what you got paul so I'm going to recommend the uh, glue spreader bottle from Rockler. I do a lot of glue laminations and, and big glue laminations. So getting the glue down quickly is the key before, because it's, you got to clamp it up before it starts to, to set. Um, so this glue spreader bottle is basically an attachment on a, a, a bottle that, that uh, uh, spreads the glue out to like a, a three inch strip, basically a three inch wide strip and uh whenever you're doing like laminations for like a butcher block or anything like that it speeds up the process so much uh because you don't have to squirt it on the wood and then spread it out it does it all in one step are you talking about the roller one the roller yeah yeah, yeah. pretty amazing i was skeptical they sent me one and and i was like well i'll give it a shot i used it on that stool video that i did and uh it works yeah it is a bit tricky peeling the dried glue off of those but it's worth it so what I realized recently, after I do the glue up, I take the thing to the sink and oh. wash it off. Yeah, and that that's a lot easier than, than waiting until afterwards. Yeah. Oh, but the peel off is so much fun. It is on every <laughs> other silicone tool, but the roller, right. like the grooves, are small enough to where it doesn't like. It's like I would say it's it feels more like trying to get a solid sheet of saran wrap on that. Yeah. <laughs> You know what I mean? Well, like it's, it's you, you have to leave enough, it and it just leave doesn't enough go. Roller, so it actually is collaborative. Collaborative? Co cohesive? No, co it's co co coagulative. Coagulated. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I like the <laughs> sink. I think, I, think, I think the sink is the way to go, though. I think you're on to something yeah, you're there. Right. Yeah, yeah even, cool. even if it's dried on there, the sink can still help to, to release it from the, the silicone. Yeah. Huh. I'll As I found in my glue test, off. even uh, um, tight bond three will dissolve in water. Yeah. Hmm. After it's it's completely dry and everything. Yeah. Yeah. So after yeah. I'm curious. So after all of your glue test, what what's in James's James's is a shop. What do you what are your go tos? Uh, tight bond two and epoxy are my my two main ones. Although yeah. I'm using I'm using so CA really, far more than I did before. Nothing really changed, <laughs> other than but, just the vast amount of knowledge. <laughs> well, I, I, I do use uh, uh, CA glues much more now. Uh, I yeah. trust them a good bit more. What do you, what, like what, so what leads you to use tight bond versus epoxy versus CA? Like what are the applications where you would? For 99% of the applications, um, tight bond is fantastic. Um, if it's indoors, it is, it's the go-to glue. I use tight bond too because I can buy it in gallons very easily. Um, mm -hmm. Type on three is a little bit better, but not by much. And you tend to have, you, you can occasionally have coloring problems with type on three. Um, but yeah, so what about, so what about CA? What do you get? What do you use that for? Uh, any smaller things, uh, anything where there's not going to be a, a structural pressure, um, CA glue and anything where I can touch it together and keep going. You know, if it, it's, if it's like a mortise and tendon where you have to slide it together, then CA glue is not the, the glue to use. Um, hmm. And then anything exterior is epoxy. Oh, huh, cool. Good to know. That's my, my list now. Uh, oh, yeah. I've got uh, uh, my tool of the week is a handsaw. A big, a beefing oh, yeah? D8 handsaw. A distant D8. And so it's a 26-inch long, 4 TPI rip saw. And uh, I became very good friends with this saw uh, the last couple of days. <laughs> And it is actually rather amazing how fast one of those works. Uh, no, it's not as fast as a circular saw, um, but they 
they will munch through wood really well. Uh, the, the problem I have with those is getting them started. <laughs> getting, you know, getting like the first little groove started with anything that's got like three or four TPI. It's just like, just wants to jump all over. Yeah, it's, it's a skill to learn. But it, yeah. Cool. Well, uh, I think you have all completely wasted another an hour with the us, the the three munchkins, <laughs> the three bearded munchkins. Oh, that's a, that's a good one. I like that. Uh, so thank you for watching. Also, uh, if you want to join us live, you can join us on the uh, YouTube channel, Creators Collective YouTube. And we record live every Thursday at uh, 10 a.m. Eastern time. I do want to say a huge thank you to our patrons on Patreon. You guys are what make this happen. So uh, thank you for that. If you'd like to help out, you can find out more at patreon.com backslash creators collective. So that's about it for this week. Until next time. See ya. Bye.